Hello, I'm James Morton and I'm a researcher at the Simons Foundation. Today I'm going to talk about a concept known as differential abundance, a technique that's commonly used to identify microbes of interest. In the previous lectures, we've talked about how to design experiments and how to perform analyses such as alpha and beta diversity. But oftentimes, when we're trying to interpret our data sets, we want to be able to see more than just clustering patterns of our biological samples. We also want to be able to identify microbes that could be explaining the patterns that we observe in alpha and beta diversity. Imagine for a moment that we're interested in utilizing 16S sequencing data to investigate obesity in mice. We don't need to build a new diagnostic for obesity. We can tell which mouse is obese just by looking at it. However, determining if there is a microbial difference between these mice is far more interesting since that could provide hints at some of the mechanisms underlying obesity. Identifying which microbes have differing abundances between these mice can give us even more hints. This is the goal of differential abundance. In practice, performing differential abundance can be tricky. Let's consider another example. Suppose we're on a boat in the ocean and we're interested in studying ocean microbes. We collect a bucket of seawater and count six orange and six blue microbes. But shortly after this expedition, there was an oil spill. We rush out on another expedition to collect another observation to now count eight orange microbes and four blue microbes. The question is, given these observations, what can we infer about what happened to these microbes? Did the blue microbes decrease in abundance? Or did the orange microbes increase in abundance? One possibility is that the blue microbes halved after the oil spill. Another possibility is that both microbes increase in abundance. Both of these scenarios will give us the same proportion of microbes. The only difference between these two scenarios is the difference between the microbial totals or the total microbial biomass. Our collected buckets could not distinguish between these two different scenarios since we don't know how many microbes there are in the entire ocean. If we want to answer the question of identifying which microbes have changed in abundance across our experimental conditions, we need to have some knowledge of how much the total microbial biomass has changed. If we're lucky, we can estimate this quantity by estimating the volume in our system and use instruments such as qPCR, spike ins, or flow cytometry to estimate the microbial cells per unit volume. However, if we cannot obtain a good estimate for the volume of the system, inferring the total microbial biomass and differentially abundant microbes becomes more complicated. If we cannot infer the total microbial biomass, then what can we infer given our measurements? To better understand this, let's try to reformulate this model in terms of simple mathematical terms. Let's encode the microbial abundances in environment A and B, as shown here. These are the true abundances in the environment for the microbial species. To determine which species have changed, all we need to do is compute the ratio of each microbe between the two environments. If this ratio is equal to 1, that implies the microbe abundance is not different between the two environments. If this ratio is greater than 1, that implies the microbial abundance is greater in environment A compared to environment B, and vice versa. If the ratio is less than 1, that implies the microbial abundance is less in environment A than in environment B. But remember, we often cannot directly observe the microbial abundances in the environment. Instead, we need to sample from the environment. From these samples, we can estimate the proportions of the microbes in this environment, and we can separate the proportions that we can measure and the total microbial biomass that we cannot observe, as shown here. With this in mind, if we try to calculate the microbial differences between the two samples, we will end up with this resulting expression. The change in the microbial abundances depends on both the change of proportions and the change of total microbial biomass. In other words, the inability to measure the total biomass will bias our estimates of the log fold change. So there you have it. Unless you're able to measure cell concentration and the total volume of the system, you cannot determine for certain if a microbe abundance has changed. Now the question is, what can we infer 
given the data at hand. In order to figure out what we can infer, we need to be able to ignore the change in total microbial biomass. One way is to take the classic chemistry approach. Similar to how concentrations are computed by taking water as a reference, we can try to identify our reference microbe. The ratio of two microbial abundances will act like a concentration, and the total biomass dependence disappears. Since these ratios don't depend on the scale of the total biomass, these quantities are said to be scale invariant. If we revisit our previous example, I may not be able to tell you if the blue microbes or the orange microbes have changed in abundance, but I can certainly tell you that the ratio of the blue to orange microbes has changed from 1 to 1 to 2 to 1. Both of the different scenarios that we were struggling with before express the same change in ratios. If I choose the orange microbe to be in the denominator, I have chosen this microbe to be my reference frame, and this concentration will measure how much the blue microbial abundance has changed relative to how much the orange microbial abundance have changed. So now the question is, how do we identify a meaningful reference microbe? There are many ways to do this, which we'll cover throughout the course of this lecture. To help us with the process of identifying these references, we will discuss another scale invariant concept known as ranking. The idea is that the microbial biomass bias applies to every species equally. While we cannot determine which microbe has changed on the absolute scale, we can sort the microbes according to how much they have changed. We refer to this procedure as differential ranking. Consider this example. Here we have two microbial populations before and after an event. If I compute the ratio between these environments for each of these microbes, I won't be able to tell you which microbe has increased or decreased in abundance. However, I can tell you which microbe has increased the most or decreased the most. If you're running statistics to identify which microbes to probe and culture, these are the statistics you want to focus on. Ranking these microbes by how much they have changed can help you and your colleagues prioritize which microbes to focus on. We have provided a high-level overview behind the idea of differential abundance analysis and highlighted some of the conceptual challenges when identifying differentially abundant microbes. Furthermore, we've shown how ratios and ranks can help alleviate some of these issues when answering biologically relevant questions. Next, we'll provide some intuition on how to perform differential abundance analysis using generalized linear models. Previously, we talked about the concept of differential abundance and how ranks and ratios can be useful. Here, we're going to talk about generalized linear models and how almost every differential abundance method is built on top of this concept. But before, but before we do that, we need to do a quick recap on analysis of variance and how linear regression is connected to this concept. The main idea behind analysis of variance, or ANOVA, is we want to determine if there is a difference between two or more groups by testing to determine if their means are different. For now, let's consider a simpler scenario. Suppose that we are only interested in observing differences in body mass index between two different populations. Here, we have collected measurements from two populations, a diseased population highlighted in orange and a healthy control population highlighted in blue. We wish to quantify the difference between these two populations with respect to their body mass index. To do so, we will denote the body mass index as a variable y, and we'll label the sick samples with x equal to 1 and the healthy samples with x equal 0. Here, x is a variable that determines if a patient belongs to a healthy group or a sick group. If we take a peek into this data set, we can see a body mass index measurement and a group label for each row in the table. Here, each row is a unique measurement for a patient. And we'll add another column, which we'll call X, and we'll replace the sick labels with ones and the healthy labels with zeros. And we'll denote the body mass index with a variable, which we'll call Y. 
If we want to quantify the difference between the body mass index measurements between these two groups, we can use the linear regression of the form y equals to beta naught plus beta one times x. Since this is linear regression, we can tune the intercept beta naught and the slope beta one to get the best model fit. Once we have identified the best values for beta naught and beta one, it can be shown that beta naught is the average body mass index for the healthy patients, and beta naught plus beta one is the average body mass index for the sick patients. You can see this for yourself. If you set x equal to zero, you will retrieve the average body mass index for the healthy patients. And when x equal to one, you will retrieve the average body mass index for the sick patients. This also implies that the difference between these two averages is given by beta one, the quantity we're actually interested in. The process of encoding these groups as zeros and ones are typically referred to as contrast because we're interested in comparing or contrasting these two groups. The cool thing about this approach is that we can easily extend this to multiple categories. Suppose I want to compare the body mass index across three different groups, a healthy group, a disease group without treatment, and a disease group with treatment. To encode this as a linear regression, we can create two contrasts. For instance, I can look at the difference between the healthy group and the disease group without treatment, in addition to the difference between the healthy group and the disease group with treatment. To encode these contrasts in a form that the computer can understand, we can represent these variables as zeros and ones. For the first contrast, C1, we can place a zero for patients that aren't in the disease group without treatment, and a one if they are in that group. Similarly, for the second contrast, C2, we can place a zero for patients that aren't in the disease group with the treatment, and a one if they are. Let's draw up what this regression will look like. Remember, from the previous example, we need to have an intercept, which we'll denote with another column of ones. Altogether, I will get three terms, beta naught, beta one, and beta two. Beta naught will give me the average body mass index of the healthy group. Beta one will give me the average difference between the healthy group and the disease group without treatment. And beta two will give me the average difference between the healthy group and the disease group with treatment. Since we're already dealing with multiple categories, there is nothing stopping us from extending this to multiple covariates. For instance, we could look at body mass differences while accounting for differences in gender. The encoding is set up in the same manner. We can build contrast for both gender and the disease group. It might seem like a lot of work, and once upon a time, all of these concepts are crafted by hand. But now, we have computers that can automate much of this process. We can use formulas to specify our experimental design to automatically generate our contrast matrix. As you can see, this contrast matrix was generated on one line of code using a software library called Patsy. These formulas can be highly expressive. You can encode continuous quantities, interaction terms to enable more complex experimental designs. I highly recommend checking out this library for more details. Now that we have done a quick recap on the analysis of variance and linear regression, we'll switch gears a little bit to tie in these concepts into our data sets. Now remember, our data is made up of sequencing counts. Because of this, we need to explicitly model these sequencing counts using counting distributions. The simplest counting distribution out there as the multinomial distribution. The probability distribution of the multinomial is given as follows. Let's try to provide some intuition exactly what this is modeling. Let's imagine that we have a huge environment with billions of microbes. If I remove one microbe from the system, the system itself isn't really impacted. If I collect a few dozen microbes, that is still a small fraction of the system. If the sample is sufficiently small relative to the environment that we are trying to measure, then we can make the assumption that the microbial count that we have measured can be characterized by a multinomial distribution. What do I mean by a multinomial distribution? Suppose we are looking at a bucket with just three colors. 
Each color represents a species, and each ball represents a microbial individual. If the proportions of microbes in this bucket are one fourth, one fourth, and one half, and if I draw 20 balls from this bucket, I should expect to get roughly 5 red, 5 green, and 10 blue balls. If I repeat this sampling process many times, and over time you may notice it's not very common to get only red balls, only green balls, or only blue balls. Here is an illustration of how these sample proportions can be represented. Each of these corners represents when a sample only observed red or green or blue balls. In the center of this triangle, we have a sample given by one-third red, one-third green, and one-third blue. Most of these samples can be found in the center, as shown by this thick cloud of points. The takeaway here is that there is uncertainty around the micro proportions that we observe. Every sample we collect is not guaranteed to give you the exact proportions of microbes in the environment, just due to the, to the sampling process itself. If we want to make informed decisions about these microbes based off of sequencing data, we need to account for this uncertainty in sampling as well. So now the next question is, how can we account for this uncertainty? How can we reconcile the multinomial distribution we just learned about with ANOVA and linear regression that we learned about previously? This is where techniques from compositional data analysis can help us. If we take a look at the distribution of multinomial samples again, you may notice it lives on the strange triangle. This triangle is known as the simplex. It's the space where all proportions live. The proportions in this space don't follow the intuitive real space properties that we're used to. The quantities here are bounded, meaning that every point is composed of proportions that sum to one. If you try to model these proportions using standard arithmetic, you will quickly run into issues with estimating negative proportions or proportions greater than one. Have you ever heard of a microbe with negative abundance? Modeling microbes with negative abundances would violate many of the biological laws that we are familiar with. In order to model proportions using standard techniques such as linear regression, we need a way to reconcile the differences that we just discussed. One way to do so is to have a transformation that can transform proportions into standard real coordinates that we are more familiar with. Fortunately, there are many ways to do this, but I want to focus your attention on just one way, in particular, the center log ratio transform. The center log ratio transform, also known as the CLR transform, is a function that takes in proportions as input and will convert them to log ratios. The transformation itself can be written as follows. If you recall from the introduction section, this is reminiscent of taking the logarithm of a concentration. The reference here is the geometric mean of the proportions. So you can think of the CLR transform as computing a log concentration, where our denominator here is the average microbial taxa proportion in our sample. Since these log ratios don't have the same constraints proportions do, we can define our linear regression as we normally would. Here, we can predict the microbial log abundances in terms of our experimental design. In this regression, beta naught is proportional to the average microbial log abundances in the healthy population, and beta 1 is proportional to the average microbial log fold change between the sick and healthy populations and X represents the labels for the sick and healthy samples. Here, both beta naught and beta 1 are d-dimensional, so you can think about this as a linear regression per microbe. If we want to cast our predictions back to proportions, we can also do that. The inverse CLR transform, also known as the softmax transform, can be given as follows. This will later prove to be extremely useful. We can perform our linear regression on log ratios and then use an inverse transform to project this regression back to proportions bounded within the simplex. It is important to note some of the caveats behind this transformation. The CLR transform cannot handle zeros because the logarithm of zero is undefined. This is a problem with microbial sequencing data because in the data set, is mostly dominated by zeros. Next, we'll discuss how linear regression 
the multinomial distribution, and the CLR transform can all work together jointly underneath the framework of generalized linear models. Here is the high level bird's eye view of our differential abundance model. We're going to have a model that takes in as input our covariance using the contrast that we have specified. This input will then be fed into a linear regression that is used to estimate the microbial log fold change we are interested in. The linear regression predictions will then be fed into an inverse CLR transform that will convert these log ratios to proportions. Finally, these proportions will be plugged into a multinomial distribution to predict the microbial counts. The observed microbial counts are then used to evaluate the likelihood or the probability our observed microbial data could be explained by our model. The model is then optimized. In other words, it is tuned in order to obtain the model that best describes our data. This model will help us answer the biological questions we had while addressing the technical challenges we have outlined. The linear regression component will help us understand the difference between microbes due to the covariance we have measured. The inverse CLR transform will help us model proportions using a standard linear regression. The multinomial distribution will help us model zero counts where traditional compositional data analysis tools will struggle. At this point, we have provided a high-level architecture of how modern differential abundance tools are built. Next, we'll discuss how to choose parameters when running these models, how to evaluate the accuracy of your model, and how to interpret the underlying model parameters. With these models at hand, we need to have a way to evaluate how good the model is. A common metric with linear regression is to use R-squared, which measures the variance in the data explained by your model. Now there's a real danger of overfitting your linear regression, where you are merely memorizing the microbial abundances instead of actually learning something biologically useful. If your data is overfitted, metrics such as R-squared will not be very informative. We can try to get a handle on overfitting through a technique called cross-validation. The idea behind this is to first fit the model using a portion of the data set, and then predict the microbe abundances for the remainder of the data set. If the error rate of the predicted microbial abundances is comparable to the model error on the training samples, then that is a sign the model can generalize beyond the samples it had observed. One way to measure this cross-validation error is through what's called a Q2 score. This is actually the same concept of R-squared, only applied to the samples the model hasn't seen before. The Q2 score has a similar interpretation to R-squared. A score close to 1 indicates a perfect fit, and a score of 0 or below indicates a very poor fit, indicative that a model has overfitted. If we go back and look at our pipeline, we can rewrite the entire model in just one line, where y represents our microbe counts that we're predicting, x is our design matrix representing our covariates, and b represents the linear regression coefficients. The question here is, how can we interpret these regression coefficients? Let's go back to the example dealing with two groups, analyzing samples from sick and healthy patients denoted by a and b. If we focus on the regression coefficients for species i and j, it turns out that the difference between these two regression coefficients will give us the average difference of the log ratio i and j between the sick and healthy patients. In addition, these regression coefficients are proportional to the log fold change. This also means that we can rank the regression coefficients from largest to smallest. So the microbe with the largest coefficient will have the largest log fold change and will be observed to be increasing the most relative to all of the other microbes. The microbe with the smallest coefficient will be observed to be decreasing the most relative to all the other microbes. We need to emphasize the term relative because we only know the log full change up to some constant value, we won't know for certain if these microbes are actually increasing or decreasing. Going back to the model evaluation, if you have an overfitted model, what are your next steps? One possibility is to get more data, either from publicly available resources or sequencing new samples. More samples can help against overfitting. Alternatively, you can employ a technique known as regularization 
that can essentially create a bound on your regression coefficients. Enforcing constraints on your regression can also guard against overfitting. To create a reasonable bound, you need to have some idea about the regression coefficients you expect. For example, if we're looking at differences before and after dietary intervention, how large of a difference do you expect? Do you expect the microbes to be completely replaced? Or do you expect an order of magnitude difference in their abundances? Suppose that you don't expect more than an order of magnitude difference. Then you can create a very tight bound on your regression coefficients. If we use a normal distribution as a prior and center that around zero, we can shape it so that 66% of the data lies within one standard deviation. This essentially means that for 66% of the microspecies, the log fold change will be less than one, if our standard deviation is one. In other words, we don't expect the majority of microbes to double or half between conditions. Taking this one step further, we expect 99% of the microbes to be within three standard deviations. In other words, 99% of the microbes are expected to have a change between 1 8th or 8 fold. If you're more focused on finding a difference instead of exactly estimating the difference, you could be more loose with these bounds. You could even incorporate the resolution of your sequencing to estimate good priors. In the average 16S experiment, there are roughly around 10,000 reads per sample. The logarithm of 10,000 is roughly around 9.2. So this means that for a given pair of samples of 10,000 reads, you cannot infer log full changes that are greater than 9.2. So if you're not sure what is a reasonable prior to set, setting your prior to a width of 9 or so is reasonable, since it's fairly close to the resolution limit of your machine anyways. Once you are satisfied with your model, then you are ready to start considering hypothesis testing. Unfortunately, how to best perform hypothesis testing is still an outstanding question, but we can definitely perform statistical hypothesis testing on individual log ratios. Here is an example of how such an exploratory analysis will look like in an interactive tool called Chiro. The ranks estimated from the generalized linear model can then be linked to the log ratios where the statistical test can be performed. While much of the content in this lecture is based on the architecture of Songbird, it is important to note the differences across different differential abundance tools. Tools such as Aldex2, DSeq2, and EdgeR will test to determine if the regression coefficient is equal to zero. In essence, this will test to see if the microbial abundance has changed relative to the average microbial abundance. The underlying assumption here is that the average microbial abundance has not been altered across experimental conditions. ANCOM, on the other hand, will test all pairwise ratios of microbes with the assumption that few microbial species have changed in abundance. Songbird does not perform hypothesis testing, but instead tries to accurately rank the microbes, providing a scaffold for interactive hypothesis testing using tools such as Chiro. There are also tools such as Filer, Filer Factor, and NICE that were designed to test differences between groups of microbes. This can be especially useful when testing differences between phylogenetic clades. As you can imagine, there are quite a few model choices that can be made within this generalized linear model framework. For instance, the multinomial distribution is amongst the simplest counting distributions that is used in Songbird and Aldex2. But there are more complex distributions, such as the negative binomial distribution that's used in DESIC2 and EDGE-R that can better account for technical variability. There are also different choices of prior distributions that can be used. I showed how to use the logistic normal distribution that's used in Songbird. If you use Aldex2, you'd use the Dirichlet distribution as your prior. In addition, the CLR transform is not the only compositional transform that can be used. There are other transforms such as the ALR, ILR, and the ArcSign transform that are commonly used to transform real valued variables to the simplex. The choice of transformation will have an impact on the choice of priors and possibly the interpretation of the regression coefficients. Furthermore, we have not discussed how to estimate model uncertainty in the regression coefficients. There is emerging work on how to perform Bayesian inference that's worthwhile to check out. I have also provided a tutorial on how to build your own Bayesian differential abundance tool. If you have made it up to this point, congratulations! 
You've just now obtained a high level overview of how to perform differential abundance analysis. The good news is that many differential abundance techniques are built on inside the framework of generalized linear models, with many of them using county distributions and some variant of the compositional transforms that we just discussed. If you've understood this material, then you are well equipped to perform differential abundance analysis on your own data sets. I look forward to seeing the exciting discoveries that you will achieve with this newfound knowledge.